Hey everyone, so I am currently in my hotel in downtown Norfolk, Virginia, and I haven't posted a video in a couple months, so I thought I would take some time and answer some more of your questions that you asked me a few months ago and give a quick little update on my current life and everything just so I don't lose complete touch with all of you. And there were some ambulances that just drove by, so there's probably going to be some background noise, so I apologize about that. Anyway, I am here in Norfolk, Virginia for work. I've been here for about two months and I have another month and a half left roughly. And I did have some small plans to hike this summer, but because of this trip, they're not going to happen. Um, and that's okay because, you know, hiking is not my entire life. I have so many other things going on which is wonderful and sometimes life just gets disrupted and that's okay. It's wonderful though because my boyfriend lives out here so um, I took this opportunity for work because he's out here so that him and I could spend a lot of quality time together and that has been absolutely amazing. <laughs> All right, let's get started. How did I get over my fear of being alone in the woods? And you know, I, I get asked this quite frequently, actually, especially by women. You know, it's a very normal, common question to have and a fear to have about like being alone. And the answer is that I never got over my fear. I think it was something that always was in the back of my mind or sometimes in the front of my mind. So a lot of the times that I did camp alone, mm, yeah, I would say like 75% of the time that I camped alone, I felt fine. Like for some reason, I just felt safe. A lot of it has to do with the scenery for me and that's a total mental thing and I understand that. But usually if I was camping alone in a wide open space or next to this beautiful lake or something like that, I felt completely fine. I just felt safe and just the scenery didn't creep me out. And then there were other times when I was alone and it was like deep, thick forest, um, just trees everywhere and bushes everywhere. And you can hear every single noise of every single critter that's moving around. And that usually seemed to freak me out more. And I did not like camping alone in that kind of environment. And like I said, it's a total mental thing and that's why I tried to really force myself to still camp in the areas that made me uncomfortable because it's not like I was scared because my risk of being hurt like increased at all because of where I was camping. It was just a total mental thing and so um, yeah, I never really got over it. I just did my best to face my fear and use like a lot of intentional logical thinking to try to help overcome those emotions. Did I ever have a oh snap moment of I have this many miles left and yeah that happened a lot. Um, in the beginning once you realize how hard it is to walk 15, 20, 25 miles a day consistently I definitely had thoughts of how am I going to do this for four more months or whatever? I would be exhausted and my body hurt all the time and it was just this wild thought of, am I really going to do this? Because I remember when I got to the 100 mile marker and it was hard. And so to think that I had to do that like 26 more times with more difficult terrain just made no sense to me but you just keep putting one foot in front of the other and especially when you get to the halfway point you're like oh my gosh I have to do this all over again but then on the flip side time just went by so quickly that you would realize that you would only have 500 miles left and you would have that feeling of oh my gosh I only have 500 miles left and you didn't want it to end and so you wanted to slow down and 
you know, I'm speaking for everybody here, so I probably shouldn't do that, but I know for me personally, and a lot of other of my close hiking friends, that we all just didn't want it to end, and we almost were freaking out that this was going to be over because we only had like 500 miles left, which is such a funny thought. You're like, wow, 500 miles is a lot of miles. But to us, once you've hiked, you know, like 2,100 miles, 500 miles was like almost nothing, you know? So yeah, I had that thought a lot. And it's just funny how different that perspective is, you know, the longer I kept hiking. Part two to that question is, and what did I tell myself to get through that? And I, I kind of already mentioned it, but you just have this huge goal in your head. And for me, I couldn't tackle that whole goal at once. I mean, you can't literally, but I also think you shouldn't do that mentally. So I just told myself to keep going one step in front of the other. And I know I've mentioned this before, but I really liked to just focus on the next town that I had to get to. And that was much more manageable for me mentally and emotionally because it was so hard for me. And I've also said this before, but I'm just not this huge ultralight crazy lover of backpacking and hiking and you know like to me it was exhausting and it was really hard i just told myself to keep going and take the trail in small little segments and to not worry about the whole thing and since i couldn't physically conquer the trail in one day i would just try to worry about what i needed to do for that one day and that's what really helped me keep going what is one thing i wish i knew more about before my hike hmm that's a really good question my instinct is to always go with oh i wish i knew more about my gear and yeah i think that's a valid answer but i figured that out on my own you know it's something that happened naturally just like getting rid of gear and my body being angry with more weight on my back. I think I wish I would have understood from the get-go how my like ego and pride was going to change on the trail. And for me, before I started hiking, I was terrified that I was going to get hurt to a point where I was going to be forced off trail and that I had all of these months beforehand planning and telling people about it and oh I was just maybe gonna get hurt in the first week and then have to go home and so I think I wish I would have understood that even that one week on trail would have been worth it and so to not have stress so much about the things that I really couldn't control and the pride of maybe being embarrassed about having to either quit early on or getting hurt early on. So my point is I think I would have let all of that like ego stuff out of my brain earlier, like starting on the trail. Like if I'm ever do another through hike again and let's say I'm doing it for a month and I hate it and it's miserable and I just don't want to be there I'm not going to continue hiking and that's not something I felt when I first started the PCT and I think that is important I'm through hiking for myself and so I think having that notion earlier on would have been wonderful but I had to learn I had to let that go and if you watched my video where I hit the 100 mile marker I'm crying and per usual and I talk about that like I had no idea that even me hiking 100 miles would make me feel so proud of myself so that's a long answer but that's that's my answer it's not a fart it's the chair you guys if I did it again, aka if I hiked the PCT again, would I want to solo it again? And the answer is yes. For me, that's just best for my personality type. Um, but maybe next time I would maybe try to stick with a group longer or the whole time just for more of the 
I think helping me be consistent, that's a weakness of mine, you know, hello, I was like taking a week off here and a week off there and three days off there. And it was just um, hard for me to be, it was just hard for me to be consistent. So yeah, I think I would be solo again and then just do my own thing. And then if I met some people who I felt really like understood how I wanted to hike and how they wanted to hike matched with how I wanted to hike, then I'd probably try to maybe stay with a group more this time, next time. Yeah. What kept me from quitting after the mountain lion was stalking me? And <laughs> this was the closest I got to quitting. I actually quit multiple times while I was hiking, but um, then you have to like still get into a town and then when you have time to kind of take a step back from a situation, you know, you can kind of talk yourself back into it again, uh, which is what I did. So short story is I was in the desolation wilderness by myself um, camping alone multiple nights and a mountain lion kept visiting my tent and I didn't understand what was going on at first but later I did and I got so freaked out and I had this huge sob fest and filmed it for everyone um, and it was awful and I never wanted to hike ever again. I was absolutely terrified. The thought of going back out on trail was awful, it made me sick to my stomach. I, like I said, was absolutely terrified. Um, my dad really wanted to come pick me up and drive me like a couple hundred miles north just to kind of get away from the mountain lion and I almost did that but at the time I really was like I want continuous footsteps and um, I was really wanting that like I said at the time um, and I don't know I'm really stubborn and kind of going back to what I was talking about earlier was it was also a pride thing but not for other people it's just myself I think when I made this goal to throw out the PCT I fashioned it in my brain a certain way and for some reason I felt like if I didn't do it the way that I had imagined then it wouldn't have felt right to me which later on completely changed but at this moment I was like, I've made it so far with how I wanted to do this hike. I want to keep going. And yeah, it was more my stubbornness that kept me from going on. But I also did not want to be scared of the trail. And so on the flip side of it, I felt like if something were to happen with me, where I go back on trail and this mountain lion finds me and attacks me and does whatever or doesn't, but let's just say, it did something as rare as it is it does happen and let's say that was the mountain lion's intent was to hurt me um, or kill me um, that's the way I'm gonna go then I'm gonna throw out the PCT because I gave up a lot of my life to do it and this was my dream and if you're gonna go out why not go out doing what you love and that was my crazy rationale um, I don't want to die and I was terrified and I cried a lot and hiking wasn't very enjoyable for a while because I was constantly looking over my shoulder. But what I did was I ran into some like friends that I knew hiking and asked if I could hike out with them and that made it better. Um, still scary because the mountain lion came and visited the campsite that night even with everyone else. But I'm very thankful I wasn't alone and I just kept going. That seems to be the answer for everything is you just take one step at a time. I can only control the things that I do. I can't control other people, animals, the weather. I can't control that. So I knew that if I skipped up 100 or 200 miles, there were going to be mountain lions there as well. There's mountain lions on the entire Pacific Crest Trail. So no matter where I went, there were going to be cougars and I just took my chances. So once again, another long answer, but yeah, it's so wild looking back at all of that while I'm like sitting in a hotel room all safe and sound. 
man, it's just through hiking is a completely different lifestyle. And it's crazy how much we push ourselves when we're in a different situation like that. Because sitting right here, I'm like, oh gosh, that's terrifying. But when you're in it and you've seen how much you've accomplished and how hard it was, you're not going to let, or maybe you shouldn't let your fear stop you. Part two to that question is, did I cowboy camp after the mountain lion experience? And the answer is not a lot. I think I did a few times, but it wasn't so much because I was scared of mountain lion. I mean, directly after, definitely would have not, but the mosquitoes were so bad at this point that I was setting in my tent as much as possible because I was getting eaten alive. And then it started to get cold and then it started to like rain and it just made more sense to be putting up my tent. But I did, I did cowboy camp a few times and I was fine. But I don't think I cowboy camped alone since then. Once again, that's a mental thing. It's like the security of a thin little tarp wall for whatever reason gives you some comfort. But yeah. What is my approach with wildlife? Mm, I love wildlife. Um, yeah, I saw a lot of really cool animals and insects and bugs and all of that on trail. I just kept the attitude that I'm in their home and they're not in mine. So we have to put the animals first and respect them. And in one of my videos, I had a little rant about bear canisters and how people weren't using them. And, you know, I was talking to a ranger about it and they have to put the bears down if the bears come and eat the people food because they get so addicted to it and then they will keep coming around humans and uh yeah i won't go into that rant now but we have to respect the wildlife but i'm fascinated by all of it and i love filming the little tiny caterpillars or like stink bugs and the spiders and the lizards and um just and everything more than that like the deer and all of that i just that was probably one of my favorite parts about hiking the trail because I got to see so much. And, you know, we really need to do our best to respect everything, even down to these little bugs and trying to avoid stepping on them. And honestly, a lot of the animals don't want anything to do with you because they're, they're scared usually. So, even the rattlesnakes, they don't want anything to do with you, but you have to respect that this is their home and doing our best to not like aggravate them. There was this one time, probably broke my heart more than any other experience on trail regarding animals. And I was camped, me and some others were camped like near this bridge and there was a baby bobcat and its mother at some point under this bridge. Now the mother had left and this little baby bobcat was literally crying all night. So I got there when it was still light out. It was crying, 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 cried all night, cried all in the morning and no one saw the mother again. And so we don't know if the mother abandoned it, but my urge to want to feed the little bobcat was so strong and I actually had to like walk away because it was making me emotional because either the bobcat's mother abandoned this little thing or maybe it was out hunting and it was gonna bring food back. But no matter how much I wanted to feed that thing, you can't because maybe the mom was coming back, but if the bobcat, the baby bobcat had contact with humans or was given human food, the mother is probably going to abandon it. You, you cannot feed the bobcats or the deer or the bears or whatever. Um, and that was really hard. Um, and I heard a rumor, this is gossip, so you shouldn't like put much into it, but I did hear that people did feed the little baby bobcat. And I got very upset to say the least because 
now the chances of it surviving is like 0% because it's going to die once you leave. And the mom's probably not going to take care of it anymore. So anyway, what was the most beneficial thing I did for preparation? And honestly, I didn't even know this before I left, but I realized this later on after someone gave me advice about it. And it's to make sure that once you leave to, let's say, go through hike or whatever you're planning on doing, to make sure that all of your ducks are in a row at home. Make sure you have enough money to cover your whole trip, plus all of your bills, plus extra for emergency funds. Make sure that your relationships are in as best standing as possible, um, that you just don't have any drama going on at home because it will pull in your headstrings and there's a high chance that that kind of stuff will take you off of trail. So I prepared the best way for me is financially I was prepared, uh, mentally I was prepared. All of the close people in my life, I just made sure like they understood like I was doing this and that I could have their support. And yeah, work was great with me taking time off. So I had everything good to go and because of that i was able to completely focus on the hike and if i were to choose to get off trail it was solely because of things that happened on trail and it had nothing to do with like outside forces of course you can't always control that because sometimes things just happen but um, for me i think that really really helped in my last q a video i was asked about the diversity of the trail and when this particular person asked me about it it was pertaining to like the landscape of the trail but somebody commented and said that immediately they thought about the diversity of the people on the trail so i thought i would talk about that and so diverse to me means different ages different races different um careers and everything else in between age wise i think it was pretty diverse. Now, the majority of people hiking that I came in contact with were either people who were retired or people who just graduated college and they have some time before they're starting their career. So at the time that I was hiking, I was 28 years old and it was not the most common age. However, I do have a good group of friends who were all about the same age. So I feel like the age span is pretty good. Um, of course, you're getting less of people in their 30s just because it's sort of an awkward time of your life. Like, you've probably been in your career for 10 years and you don't really have the ability to just leave, especially if you have kids and all of that. But that was pretty surprising in a good way. Race, it is a very white trail and hiking in general, I think the outdoors, is predominantly white people, which is why I think a lot of companies are trying to, you know, advertise and show that you don't just have to be white to be in the outdoors. I came across a lot of people from a lot of countries, um, a lot actually from Korea and China and Israel, and then you have like Sweden and Germany and uh, England. So you have a bunch of people from tons of different cultures and races and then Americans you know you've got every single color on on the trail but there's just not an abundance I think for me I thought also that there were going to be a lot of extremely skinny in shape people on the trail and yes there are but there's actually some people who to say this gently who were overweight and they were killing it and it was amazing. I met a lot of people on trail, you guys. Even with careers, I met ex-commanding officers of submarines, all the way down to literally like hippies. Like they literally call themselves hippies. Or people who are homeless, um, like they're choosing to be homeless and so they're just like, sure, why not? I, I just came out to the trail to backpack and so you, you're meeting a whole range of people 
even career wise. And so, yeah, you have people of different colors and different professions and different ages and different body types. And it's really awesome. There obviously is still more in shape people and more white people. And you know what I'm saying? Like you still have that, but it's not, it's not all that's out there. So if you are someone that feels like you are maybe an outlier in the through hiking community, you might be in some regard, but you're also not. And what's really great about the through hiking community is you are going to be welcomed just as much as anybody else who steps on that trail. So I know it's really easy for me to just say this, but don't let that fear of maybe being an outlier scare you from doing something like this if it's really what you wanna do. Did I ever feel unsafe as a woman on the trail? Um, no, on the trail, I actually felt pretty safe and almost every single hiker I met, I felt very comfortable with. There's always a few weirdos that I try to stay very far away from, but I wasn't like worried they were gonna hurt me physically. Like nothing happened that made me feel like my life was in danger. Um, there were a couple times in towns, ironically, where I did feel very unsafe and I had one scary incident in Trout Lake, Washington. But other than that, yeah, I felt very safe. Is it possible to avoid camping alone? And yeah, I think so. Especially in the beginning of the trail, there's so many people that sometimes I would worry that I would get to a campsite and there wouldn't be any spots to camp. And that never happened. There was always room, but for sure, like especially in the beginning, like I said, there's always people everywhere. Um, and then maybe by that, by like a few months, you find a group of people that you really enjoy hiking with and it becomes a thing where you guys all camp together every single night. As you get further up uh, or further into the trail, whether you're going Nobo or Sobo, the preface, this is for those going northbound. More people have left the trail, more people are spread out, so the chances of you hiking and camping alone are much higher. But if you do have like a core group of friends on the trail, usually all those people will stuck together. Like I said, I did my own thing a lot, so sometimes I would camp next to someone who I didn't even know, <laughs> or other times I would be alone. How did I keep my confidence when others weren't as supportive? I think by the time I started hiking, I was going <laughs> and all of my like relationships that maybe weren't that supportive before I left had already been worked out and no one was ever like extremely unsupportive of me. It was just more confused and I think I got, I got all that worked out before I left for the trail. But I think when I left for the trail, I was like, okay, I'm doing this. You know, I wasn't gonna worry about what other people thought. You can't do that because that's never helpful. And then unsupportive people online, sometimes it bothered me simply for the fact that other people expected me to put up with that. That sometimes frustrated me more. But at the same time, these are strangers who are commenting probably never done anything like this before, so I'm not gonna take advice from people like that or listen to their commentary. It has no value to my life. So my confidence didn't really, didn't really waver from other people's either, from other people's lack of support. Now having people's support and encouragement is incredible. Like this community, it was amazing to be, to be in when I was hiking. Um, I just really tried to make sure that I highlighted all of the positive comments and people and that's truly I think what made an actual impact in my hike, not the negative stuff. Should you enter the Sierra Nevada alone? Uh, okay, it's always different situations, right? So my year, last year, 2018, there Obviously it was still snow, but it wasn't crazy like this year in 2019. So yeah, I felt safe hiking alone last year in the Sierra Nevada. There were still some sketchy parts, 
um, I still had some really powerful uh, stream crossings and you know there, there were still moments of anxiety but this year let's say with all the snow no I don't think it would be a good idea to enter that alone it doesn't matter if you're experienced or not male or female I think there's so much snow and probably really heavy stream crossings that I think it's more so of you feeling more comfortable, you know? So it all depends. I'm watching some of my friends. I'm watching, I'm lurking behind trees. And I'm like following some, some friends, I'll call them. They're like social media friends who are hiking the CDT. And there's a ton of snow in those mountains. And some of these people are alone and they're doing it. And so I think being alone or not, it's not so much like it's automatically going to be safer. I think it's a mental thing where you just feel safer and more confident when you have another person. And yeah, I'm not the expert, but to be honest, I think it's more of a, it makes you feel safer. I don't really know how much safer it actually makes you. It gives you two brains though. If you are faced with a sketchy situation, you have, two different brains to work a solution out. Like I said, I have friends who are alone in some very sketchy, snowy, mountainous areas and they're kicking butt. So it all depends. If you don't feel comfortable, don't do it. Would I have had different gear at the end to stay more dry? Yes. So something that I definitely would have brought if I were to redo it would be rain pants. I just was like, oh yeah, shorts will be fine because you, you know, you're just gonna get soaking wet anyway, but I really just really wanted rain pants. I also probably would have bought a better rain jacket. Um, I had friends who had amazing rain jackets and it was raining so much that even those jackets got soaked. But my frog dogs was like ripping and it was too small and it just didn't cinch up as well as I wanted. It was great for my budget at the time, so I totally recommend Frog Togs if you know, you're know you on a budget. It was wonderful, it got me through, but I, I already have bought a new lightweight rain jacket of better quality, so yep. And definitely 100% I would have brought more socks. If I could, I probably would have brought like 10 pairs of dry socks, and I'm not kidding because Putting on wet, cold, freezing socks every morning is awful. It's absolutely awful. And I always try to keep my socks as dry as possible, but there are days when it was just pouring rain, pouring rain, pouring rain, pouring rain. And I was just running through all of my dry socks and I obviously needed to keep at least one pair dry so I could sleep in them. But that meant I had to like start all over again and put on my wet, disgusting muddy dirty socks and it's awful so rain pants a better rain jacket and more socks and the last question for this video is did I find it hard to return to my normal life after trail and I did it's crazy reflecting on the trail itself and post trail like immediately post trail I was really sad, like really, really sad. And I don't like to use the term depression for myself because I don't wanna take away from people who really do suffer with depression. I would call mine like post-trail blues. And there's so much I could say about this, but to not give a super long answer, I was really sad. I think the best way I can explain it is that the trail was so overstimulating in all of the best ways and underwhelming in all the right ways. And when I came back to like real life, you know, my job and friends and family and just driving and all of that, it flipped the script. So I was extremely overwhelmed in a bad way and then 
day to day was just underwhelming. It made no sense to me why I had to get up and go to work for somebody else and sit at a desk and do everything I needed to do and then just go home and then do all these errands. Like I had all of these things I needed to do. Even taking a shower annoyed me. Like I, I'm only having to do this so I don't smell to other people. That's, that was my mentality then, was having to shower more and now I have to do all of this like actual cooking and I have to pay all these bills and I have to like move and go through all these things that I have, like clothes and trinkets and I just wanted to throw it all away and um, I'm just working all day just to make money to pay for all these things I don't want and it got really hard. I also had a hard time communicating a lot with people. I mean, it was just overstimulated all the time. But now I don't feel that way anymore. I feel like I've really acclimated again and I'm enjoying a lot of things about life that really stressed me out when I got back from trail. And I miss through hiking all the time. I, I talk about it all the time. My Instagram's always photos from me hiking the PCT. It's affected my life so much, but I'm also not bothered that I'm not hiking now because I'm still having so many other like adventures. And, you know, I tell this to people a lot that I'm not trying to become like a professional through hiker. There's so many other parts of my life that I really enjoy. And um, so I knew I had to learn how to get back into life again. I would change things if I did one another time. I wouldn't immediately go back to work. I think that was not good. I would definitely try to have less stuff, which I'm still trying to take care of now, little by little. Um, donating things, selling things, um, making sure I'm not overbuying items. I mean, that's a whole nother tangent I could go on, but. Yeah, I feel like I have a better understanding of what I would need to make sure I can have an easier transition. But anyway, that's it for this video. I purposely wanted this to not be very long, but I'm very chatty, as you all know. So this is still pretty long, either fortunately to some or unfortunately to some. I am going to do another and final Q&A video because I, there were so many questions and I wanted to answer as many of them as possible. So I will be making another video and it will be posted much sooner than this one was posted after the first Q&A video. I do apologize about the long break in videos, but um, this isn't my job and I've been working, you know, and doing other stuff in my life and so I really appreciate everyone's patience and understanding. Also, if you are new to this channel, welcome and hello. There's There are no real rules around here. I don't have like a set day that I post videos. I pretty much do it whenever I want. Um, that's just my style. So uh, thanks again everyone for being very patient and still sticking around and not leaving me. Um, yeah, if you haven't found me on Instagram and want to follow along there, you can find me at The Whimsical Woman. I've been posting a lot of pictures from the PCT. Some people have already seen before, some they have not. I've just been on a fantastic selfie posting series for some reason. But if you go there, you can find me, follow me, message me. I message everyone back, except for this rare time when I accidentally deleted a bunch of new messages. So if that was you, I am really sorry, but I do respond to everybody. And yeah, I'd love to connect and I will see you guys soon. All right, bye. The water is so turquoise and blue.